Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Michael Malona, joined here by Dr. Lauren Weinlein. And so we recently presented a paper at the Philosophy and non Monogamies Conference at Pomona College. And so we're just going to talk through that paper here. And now this paper was written for a specialist audience, but hopefully it will still be useful and interesting despite that. Um, perhaps before we get going, we'll go ahead and do quick introductions. Uh, Lauren, do you want to do you want to go ahead? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Lauren Weindling. I am currently a fellow at the Center for Renaissance and Reformation Studies. Um, I earned my doctorate in 2017 uh, in comparative literature from the University of Southern California. And since then, I've taught at Auburn and a university and a handful of universities in the greater Toronto area. Um, my research is in early modern drama of England, France, and Italy, and I'm interested in questions at the intersection of literature and science, particularly discourses of bodily determinism, uh, contagion, and epistemology. Uh, I have a book coming out uh, this upcoming April entitled Thicker Than Water, uh, Blood, Affinity, and Hegemony in Early Modern Drama. And while that book looks at discourses of love, um, particularly in a familial context, but also in terms of something we might call erotic or romantic love, um, this is my first time working in a strictly kind of philosophical framework uh, and uh, looking at romantic love specifically. So, uh, so I'm really excited to to be engaging in this uh, this research uh, program with uh, Dr. Milana. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for dragging you into this whole philosophy <laughs> thing. So I am a philosopher. I'm currently an assistant professor at Toronto Metropolitan University in downtown Toronto. I earned my PhD at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. I spent some time at Cornell uh, as a postdoc and at Auburn University as an instructor. And my research centers on largely metaethics and moral epistemology in particular. So I'm really interested in how we get moral knowledge or whether that's possible. And this has led me to explore the emotions as a potential avenue for, for moral knowledge. And so I've written quite a bit about the emotions and about desire and as well as, as hope. But can I have a kind of side project that's a bit connected with my main research on, on uh, that's on hope and also a bit on despair as well. So that's a bit about me. This romantic love thing kind of emerged in the course of teaching a class on philosophy of love and sex and having lots of conversations with Dr. Weinlane about it. And maybe I should say we are married. So it's kind of an interesting <laughs> feature of this. Uh, but we'll go ahead and we'll talk through the paper. I'll start and then I'll kick it over to Dr. Weinlane. So I'm going to go ahead and share the, the handout so you can see this. And as I go through, uh, Lauren, feel free to chime in if I if I miss something that's that's important, as I as I probably will. OK, so just to get started, our main thesis, which we're just going to state here at the beginning, is that polyamory's ethical or evaluative dimensions are in tension with romantic love. And a secondary thesis, which is largely going to be in the background, is that these tensions provide strong reason not to endorse romantic love as an idealized or perhaps even as a desirable form of love. Okay. Now, with respect to our main thesis, there's a handful of things that we're going to need to get clear about. So the first is how we're understanding polyamory and what we're calling polyamory's ethical or evaluative dimension. So we're going to use the term in a somewhat special sense that doesn't map on to how the term is always used. The term could be used in different ways, but we're going to mean it in a particular way throughout this talk. We're also going to need to say how we understand romantic love. And it's going to be a really important assumption for us that romantic love is a distinctive form of love that is separate from, say, non-romantic friendships or family love. And this is really where the interdisciplinary nature of our project comes in. And we're going to rely heavily on the work of the Swiss cultural and literary theorist, Denis de Rougemont, uh, in his 1930s book, Love in the Western World. And de Rougemont thinks that love is a kind of story or a narrative. And 
this story is one that involves exclusivity, kind of oaths of fidelity not to love anyone else, but uh, this element of the story can be removed. And when it's removed, what we're going to argue is that there are still tensions with the rest of the story of romantic love. So in a way, uh, as we envision uh, romantic love, as we sketch romantic love, exclusivity is really functioning as a kind of cherry on top of the way that romantic love independently functions. Okay. So some comments on what we mean by intention with. Roughly, we're gonna, we're gonna largely leave this intuitive, but if you wanna gloss on it, you might say that romantic love is going to render intelligible or make sense of patterns of behavior and, and emotion that polyamory, as we understand it, renders intelligible working against. And these tensions are going to arise on a number of fronts. Again, even once any commitment of exclusivity is officially removed. And to illustrate our thesis, we can make a quick contrast here with heteronormativity. And so heteronormativity in romantic love versus polyamory in romantic love. So traditionally, romantic love has been thought of as between a man and a woman. Um, this has been more or less stringent at different points. I mean, the, for the, the ancient Greeks, although they would have spoke of eros, um, you know, male-male love was certainly part of that picture. Shakespeare also wrote, I think, over right over 100 sonnets were uh, to the fair youth, which was man to man, right? That's that's yes. my asking my literature expert to make sure that that's true. <laughs> um, and so, as we as sort of we envision the story of romantic love uh, from De Rougemont, uh, when you remove heteronormativity from the picture, the rest of the structure of romantic love largely just stays comfortably intact. But when you remove exclusivity that's a more central node is kind of what we're saying. So you're going to get tensions that arise um, uh, even once you remove that exclusivity as a specific requirement. Now, a bit more about our background perspective. As you can probably guess, we're on the side of those who are skeptical about the ultimate value or wisdom of pursuing romantic love. Uh, we're not saying that polyamory is the best, although we think that there's much to be said in favor of it. And we think that even monogamous romantic lovers have good ethical reason to kind of uh, reject romantic love. But as a kind of internal narrative, monogamous romantic love is more cohesive. Now, if you combine monogamous romantic love with marriage, then we think you actually do get some tensions that arise that are quite structurally analogous to the tensions that arise for combining polyamory and romantic love. And in fact, that tension with marriage is one of de Rougemont's big points in his Love in the Western World book. Okay, so let's skip down to polyamory and how we're understanding it. So uh, as you can probably guess, we are not going to define polyamory in terms of romantic love. So there's an, an openness to multiple loving relationships in polyamory but it's not necessarily romantic loving relationships. And we're also going to treat polyamory as distinct from what's sometimes called polyfidelity. So a polyfidelitous relationship involves constraints that are structurally very similar to the constraints in a monogamous relationship on, in terms of certain kinds of emotional and sexual intimacy that make it monogamous. In polyfidelity, you have, you have similar constraints, but they're just between more than two people. So you might have X, Y, and Z uh, that have constraints that confine forming new relationships outside of what is often called a, the polycule. And we're also going to assume forms of polyamory that eschew any kind of prescriptive hierarchy. So the idea that one, uh, the, the one might prescribe a certain partner as the primary partner. So we're going to assume non-hierarchical forms of polyamory, polyamory. And we also wanna say a bit more about polyamory as, as something that has built into it certain ethical dimensions or certain values. And so at the, at the very least, this is going to involve consent as well as, as well as open, honest, and trustworthy communication. Now, good communication is a tricky notion. It doesn't mean necessarily somebody divulging everything that they 
feel to somebody else so they don't have any privacy. There's also, you know, certain ways in which people can use therapy speak or good communication speak to actually be manipulative. And so, but the ideal uh, is that there is some kind of good communication that might be relationship specific. And that's a complicated question, exactly what that entails. But we're going to go beyond this and adding four additional points. In some cases, these points may just point to what's required for good communication. In some cases, they may clearly go beyond uh, simply good communication. So the first point that we want to emphasize is emotional work. So polyamorous relationships have uh, often a complex structure. So instead of just lover and beloved, there's potentially the lover's lover, which would be known as uh, one's metamor. And metamors can also be an uh, can have a relationship as well. And that will be a different kind of relationship than the relationship between lovers. And so these different relationships that emerge in the polyamorous structure create new possibilities for positive or negative emotions. And so this kind of, uh, this kind of, these new relationships that emerge um, raise questions about how to kind of regulate and deal with one's emotions. So on the one hand, uh, to be a trustworthy communicator, one is going to want to, as much as possible, all else equal, absorb calmly one's beloved's intense emotions. So maybe two people have been in a relatively calm relationship for three or four years. One of them begins a new relationship that has intense new relationship energy, as it's sometimes called, or NRE. And, you know, as that person is working through that, the lover that they've been with will, all it's equal again, want to try to absorb that new relationship energy calmly to work with them through these um, new, exciting, but also kind of challenging situations. Also, as I indicated earlier, an effort to interrogate where one's emotions are coming from and to regulate them potentially if need be. There's actually a whole literature on emotion regulation. I won't dig into that here, but the possibility of like understanding one's emotions and regulating them uh, for the sake of one's own health or the health of one's relationship is going to be an important dimension. And also regular check-ins. This doesn't mean like constantly forcing someone to have a conversation, but checking in to make sure that things are going well on a regular basis. And related to this is what we're going to call realism on the handout. And the aim here is to seek a true rather than some idealized or fantastical conception of the beloved. Um, as well as one's relationships. Okay, so that's going to facilitate the emotion regulation and is also one of the attractive features of polyamory. Okay. Additionally, there's what we're going to call creative exploration. So unlike other kinds of loving relationships, like traditional um, monogamous relationships, there's less of a script for polyamory to follow. And so this open and honest communication sets the stage for potentially designing loving relationships in the ways that are the best for the people involved. And so that's an especially attractive feature of polyamory. Also, uh, some, of, some of you may have heard the word compersion. Compersion in this context refers to uh, a kind of, it's, it's a kind of foil to jealousy. I mean, saying it's the opposite of jealousy can be a bit misleading, but the idea is that when one's lover is in a relationship with someone else and one, you know, one, one is not actively involved in that as well, one may evaluate that relationship as positive and also feel positively about it. And that's compersion. And sort of we see compersion as at least all it's equal something uh, that's desirable in a polyamorous context. Okay, so that's a bit about how we're thinking about polyamory with some fairly robust evaluative aspects to it. And so when we talk about polyamory, we're going to mean it in this sense. Okay, so now we want to say a little bit about romantic love and why we're going to end up going in the direction that we are uh, with respect to romantic love and why we're kind of turning away from some standard kind of philosophical approaches to romantic love. We're not going to be able to say anything conclusive here, but we're just going to give, again, just a a bit of the flavor of why we end up going the way that we do. A couple starting points to keep in mind. For us, again, it's really important that romantic love is distinct from non-romantic friendships. When I teach this topic, students sort of, on the one hand, see this as something that's very obvious, but on the other hand, it's very elusive to pin down what this difference is. 
And another point that, that I'll just state, we won't really be able to get into, is that we think if there's a liminal space or a kind of no man's land between friendship and romantic love, we ultimately want to cede that space to friendship, right? And this has to do with the way in which romance tends to be idealized and to kind of put itself above other kinds of relationships. But that's just a little a bit of the flavor of that. Um, we're also not particularly interested here in accounts of romantic love that would reduce it to something biological. There may be something interesting to say about the biological organs, origins of, of love. In fact, we, that's, we have no qualms with that, but we're interested in love as something that is experienced, that's part of human, um, you know, human, human life, not something that's what, what some philosophers might characterize as like subpersonal processes. Okay. But what makes it so difficult to figure out what romantic love is, as we see it, is that there are so many similarities between what some philosophers want to say about romantic love and non-romantic friendships. So we're just going to list some things that philosophers have said about romantic love that also seem to imply equally well to non-romantic friendships. And we're not saying that the, these philosophers would deny this. In fact, some of these philosophers are a bit anti-romantic too. Uh, but we just want to point out these features to kind of highlight the difficulty of distinguishing these two kinds of love. So first, there's an element of selectivity. So your family relationships are given to you for the most part. But when it comes to romantic love, it's somehow like particular people are picked out. And the same thing happens with friendship. So like making sense of the selectivity is a bit tricky, but it seems present in both the friendship and romantic love case. Additionally, both friendship and romantic love can involve sexual desire, or they might not involve sexual desire. So there can be people who are asexual, but not necessarily aromantic. And in fact, my understanding is that most people who are asexual do not report being aromantic. So they're, um, they have romantic desires, but not necessarily um, sexual desires. And it's often said about love that it involves a substantial concern for the well-being of the beloved, but that can also be present in a friendship as well. Sometimes philosophers will talk about a recognition of intrinsic value in the other person that can be present in friendship. Certainly, there's this kind of funky idea of a bestowal that's associated with the work of a philosopher named Irving Singer. And so bestowal is supposed to not involve recognizing value that already exists in the beloved and also not instrumentalizing the beloved for one's own ends, but in some way bestowing value upon them. And to the extent that we can make sense of this idea, it seems to be present in both friendship and romantic relationships, or it can be present in both. Uh, it's sometimes said that love involves a desire to change and grow. That can also happen in friendships. Uh, there's an interesting recent paper by a philosopher named uh, Monique Wonderly, and she talks about the importance of security-based attachment relationships for romantic love. Uh, for her, this is supposed to capture the special way in which love has a self-interested dimension. And this can also be present in friendships and she's quite explicit about that. So it's really tricky to pin down the thing that's special about romantic love. One strategy uh, that's been highlighted and here we're um, getting this from the work of uh, Carrie Jenkins, um, not that she defends this view, but that this is kind of an idea that she discusses in her 2017 book that we're also just going to quickly mention here. And this is this idea that what society might do is take certain psychological or subpersonal biological processes and kind of give them a script or a role to play. And so a traditional Western script, uh, which again, Jenkins is not a fan yeah. of this herself, but uh, she talks about this. And so you might, you might take something like a man and a woman, they have attraction, initial courtship, they then have physical affection, marriage, children, and then this peaceful happily ever after White House picket fence, all that kind of stuff, right? So, I mean, this is kind of, at least in our view, a strange script that we see in society. And it's a strange script because we think that people kind of know that the things later 
on that script, like marriage and children and peaceful happily ever after, tend to actually work against romantic love. That it's it's actually difficult to get one's romantic love to survive that um, those trials and tribulations. Like romantic love, in a way, like struggles with um, peacefulness. And we also uh, note, as Jenkins says, that this like script is not super promising from the perspective of non-traditional relationships. And not just polyamory, but I mean, immediately the, the man and woman requirement is going to go, other aspects of the script are going to go, and then we're sort of thrown back to this question of like, well, what is the special thing about romantic love? Okay. And on our approach to romantic love, it's going to be a kind of story. And it's a story that assigns a starring role to the passions. And the remainder of this talk is going to go through the story and see how it intersects with polyamory as we've discussed it. And so now I'm going to kick it over to Dr. Weinling. Thank you, Dr. Malona. So my task then for the day is to get on the table our vision of romantic love, this model that we've been referring to. And as mentioned, this model is uh, inspired by the work of Denis de Rougemont and particularly his book L'Amour et l'Occident, or Love in the Western World, which was published in 1939. Now, Denis de Rougemont's uh, model of romantic love arises from his reading, his analysis of what he calls romantic love's foundational myth, namely uh, the chivalric uh, romance or uh, the medieval narrative of Tristan and Isolde, which arose in uh, various versions in Britain, France, and Germany in the 12th century. And we've somewhat repackaged or translated this model for a contemporary and philosophically minded audience. There's a quick caveat to be made, of course, about uh, utilizing this model in our analysis, and that is that it is an explicitly Western model. Uh, after all, this is love in the Western world. Now, our reasoning for this is really a matter of this Western model's ubiquity, certainly on account of colonialism, globalization, a myth that originated in, the, in Western Europe has had an enormous reach. Now, there has been some really interesting work uh, about the encounter of this Western uh, model with non-Western cultures, the extent to which it has landed due to similarity with other cultural models or not. Um, and this work is really interesting. Uh, we're not going to be able to touch on that today, but, um, but it, there is some really fascinating work out there about this kind of um, in cultural encounters between this Western model and other their models of love. So our aims for this section are twofold. Uh, the first is to sketch each characteristic of romantic love and give just a little bit of a taste for the ubiquity of this model in the cultural imaginary. Our experience teaching this material is that um, once students see it, they kind of can't unsee it and we'll get a lot of emails afterwards. Oh, it's in this story. And what about this song and so on and so forth. So um, part of the force of this model really is its ubiquity. And I hope to give a, at least a little bit of a taste for that in the presentation today. The second aim is to then uh, illustrate the uh, tension of each component of this model with the values of polyamory as we have outlined them. So the first component of romantic love to address is that of exclusivity. And this is the element that we obviously need to excise from the get-go. So chivalric uh, romance specifically, the kind of quote origins of this model um, required oaths of eternal fealty or fidelity of the chivalric hero to their beloved. 
And the, uh, do the this oath was uh, twofold. First, it was a promise or an oath that uh, the chivalric hero would not engage in any kind of similar relationship with anyone else other than this specific beloved, so that this relationship was unique, special. And the second was uh, a kind of hierarchy, namely that uh, this relationship between the hero and their beloved um, would take precedence, would trump all other moral duties, obligations, um, affections that they might have for others. So we see this in relatively benign ways in uh, our cultural imaginary. Uh, some people call this mononormativity, the kind of uh, norm of monogamy that is pervasive throughout uh, our cultural imaginary. Um, we see this in lyrics like, I only have eyes for you, or L is for the way you look at me, O is for the only one I see. Um, aphorisms like uh, forsaking all others, uh, or love conquers all. Here love is glossed really as, as romantic love specifically. And what's being connoted here is that romantic love, that relationship is going to, to conquer, to outweigh all other relationships, duties, obligations, morals, etc. Uh, this is the element that we obviously need to excise um, and remove, but I think what we'll find or what we hope to demonstrate here is that even once we remove any kind of explicit oaths of exclusivity, that a lot of these other characteristics pull towards the lover acting as though they are exclusive. So I'll outline those elements now. The second uh, component to address then is that love is painful. Love hurts, as in the Nazareth song. Uh, love is an illness. Uh, Denis de Rougemont opens his, uh, his book with the statement that happy love has no history. Romantic love is not about contentment. Romantic love is about passion. And just as we say the passion of the Christ, passion is about suffering. Um, this uh, painful aspect of romantic love was uh, deemed a literal illness in the context of uh, Galenic medicine. Uh, but of course, uh, the kind of typical um, uh, symptoms of love's illness, this kind of, uh, I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't think about anything else. I yearn, I burn, I ache. This is going to be familiar to anyone who has read love poetry uh, going back to the classical period of Sappho, Catullus, and Ovid through the Renaissance of Petrarch and Shakespeare and um, into really any kind of contemporary popular romantic love song. So the tension here uh, as we see it is that Love sickness really kind of pushes the lover uh, towards an obsessive kind of attitude with a particular beloved, and therefore an inclination to ignore or forget other relationships and commitments that they might have. And polyamory's values favor monitoring, subduing, doing the kind of emotional work uh, for these uh, to, to kind of temper these feelings in order to be able to nurture the multiple relationships that one has and to really show up and be present for each individual partner. The third element to address in this model is that romantic love is it has a supernatural or magical force to it. Um, in romance narratives, uh, this uh, supernatural or magical force was conceived of as a, a literal force. So famously, um, in uh, Tristan and Isolde, uh, the two fall in love by virtue of accidentally drinking a love potion. Um, 
Cupid's arrow is another good example of this kind of being struck by love from outside. This is not something that you choose, but even metaphorically, uh, famously, uh, Romeo and Juliet fall in love across a crowded room, falling in love at first sight as though overtaken by this magical or supernatural force. Even the aphorism of uh, falling in love. Falling is not something that we typically do on purpose. Um, so it, it kind of captures the fact that uh, a lover cannot help that they love and they cannot really fully help whom they love either in this tradition. There are two purposes or consequences to uh, this aspect of romantic love. Uh, the first is uh, really in the context of, of narrative. Uh, the fact that lovers are passive victims of love's force uh, makes them a bit more sympathetic uh, because otherwise uh, it's very difficult to um, like uh, lovers given the kind of immoral, foolish, uh, irrational actions that they might undertake in love's name. Uh, but we kind of see this in more um, uh, benign ways as well in our kind of quotidian moment. Let's say that uh, you have a good friend who you know has just spent the evening with someone that they're in a new relationship with. You have a coffee date with them planned for the next day. And of course, they forget your coffee date and they stand you up. And we might be inclined in that context to kind of, you know, cut them some slack and say, oh, it's fine, they're in love. So this is one sort of uh, purpose or consequence of uh, rendering lovers sympathetic because they don't, they aren't fully in control, at least according to this model. The second is the notion that love is transcendent, that love's magical or supernatural force lies in its ability to uh, offer a heightened experience of the world or really in some sense offer an escape from the world. Uh, Denis de Rougemont points to uh, the Manichaean roots of this aspect of romantic love. Um, and we see this going back even to uh, Plato's Symposium. The beloved, in some sense, is an instantiation of the form of the good, that what is true, what is beautiful. And then love is the thing that propels us towards the good and the true and the beautiful and out of offers kind of an escape from our quotidian um, uh, material existence in which we are trapped inside of our bodies. Um, a couple of nice examples of this aspect of uh, romantic love is the 80s classic ballad, Love Lifts Us Up Where We Belong. Uh, another one of my favorites comes from uh, Stephen Sondheim's musical company, in which the uh, protagonist, who is this kind of confirmed bachelor, by the end of the musical has, uh, you know, come to this realization that uh, that they want uh, love, uh, romantic love specifically in their life. And, and they sing this song about being alive, that um, alone is alone, not alive, that romantic love is somehow uh, necessary to truly live. Uh, beautiful song, obviously a little problematic, but nonetheless, um, these are just some some examples to kind of give a give a, a sense for for this sort of uh, impulse. We see three tensions of this aspect of love with the uh, values of polyamory. The first tension is that this tradition makes bad behaviors intelligible, potentially excusable, and even maybe desirable from the perspective of the beloved. I mean, one could see in this kind of framework, the beloved being really flattered that uh, the lover has uh, lost track of or forgotten other kinds of commitments and duties that they have, because that would be a mark of how much their lover loved them. 
And so uh, it seems that uh, the values of polyamory would not want to advocate for this kind of, uh, or excuse this kind of bad behavior um, in uh, not showing up appropriately for one's other relationships. The second tension is that uh, polyamory really uh, advocates for an active regulation of emotions, this kind of checking in, emotional work, uh, the kind of creative impulse uh, that uh, we've discussed thus far, that uh, one is an agent, uh, the lover is an agent in creating their uh, emotional life, in constructing it uh, with others. And this really pulls against this notion of being a passive victim of love's force. The third tension is that uh, viewing love as transcendent tends to encourage the lover to elevate the beloved above others, at least in some respect. Um, and therefore invites comparisons, which might uh, lead to a certain kind of hierarchy, which pulls against uh, the, uh, the values of polyamory that we've outlined. The fourth element of romantic love is that it is impeded. It requires obstacles to maintain. And this is basically because of the function of desire, how desire works. Uh, that intense desire and particularly the kind of intense passion that is central to uh, this model depends on lack. It depends on being separated uh, from one's beloved, from uh, not having kind of unfettered access, if you will, uh, to the object of one's love. And um, that uh, as soon as those obstacles are removed, that the intensity of that desire would be diminished um, at the very least. So we see that the more serious the obstacle, the more intense the passion. This is why romantic love uh, traditionally has been utterly at odds with socially sanctioned marriage because socially sanctioned marriage doesn't offer the requisite kind of distance, the requisite kind of obstacle to maintain this kind of passion. So in uh, romance narratives, we often see this obstacle being that this love is adulterous. Um, so this is the case for, say, Paris and Helen of the Iliad or uh, Vronsky and Anna Karenina of Tolstoy's novel. Um, but this uh, kind of obstacle doesn't have to be merely adultery. Uh, it could be love across class divides. Um, I am told by my students that there is a kind of biological incompatibility between um, mortal and vampire, which is at the center of the Twilight trilogy. But what's really interesting about this aspect of romantic love, particularly as we see it arise in narrative, is that characters will often search for or create more obstacles in order to maintain this distance, which is required to, to, to fulfill or, or maintain the passion. So uh, my favorite example of this comes from Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence. Uh, in it, the central protagonist um, at the end, all of the external obstacles um, that are preventing him from being with his beloved fall away. His wife has died. Um, he now has the kind of like social sanction uh, or the okay given by his son to pursue this relationship. And so he goes to Paris where she's living and he is sitting in a courtyard outside of her apartment and he is looking up at the window and deciding and, 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 and in conflict about whether or not to go up. And he walks away and you're screaming at the book, like, what are you doing? Why aren't you going up? And it's because at some level, the, the novel sort of explains, it's because at some level he knows that to be with her, to be with his beloved, cannot possibly live up 
to the fantasy, the romantic narrative, the experience of passion that he has had for her in being separated from her for all of these years throughout his life. We see a couple of tensions of this element of romantic love and polyamory. Uh, the first is that this narrative encourages the lover to view any forces that create separation uh, between them and their beloved as obstacles. Um, and ultimately, uh, in line with polyamory's values, viewing, um, say, one's lovers, uh, other lovers as obstacles uh, would pull push against the kind of cultivation of compersion, uh, which does seem to be an, at least a, a, an ideal. The second tension is that the kind of open and honest communication uh, with all of the partners involved in one's relationships um, actively works against the kind of conflicts and drama that might create obstacles, which would sustain a kind of more intense feeling of desire or this passion for any particular relationship or particular beloved. This leads me to the final element of romantic love, and that is that the conclusion or consummation of romantic love is death. And it's either the death of the desire or the love, namely that once the obstacle has been removed, once one is with the object of one's love, that that intensity of desire is going to be extinguished. Um, and if not maybe entirely extinguished, then at least diminished greatly. Uh, the alternative, to that is that the lovers die together, uh, often in each other's arms um, at the same time, and that uh, this trope is so common that it is, even has a, um, a particular uh, phrase in German called the Liebestod or love death. And the lovers die together in this moment, you know, think of Romeo and Juliet, in some sense for two reasons. Uh, the first is that they cannot imagine living without their beloved. And the other is that they maybe cannot fully imagine living without um, this experience of romantic love, that to live in a world where this romantic love with this beloved has been diminished or extinguished would be a real loss. A couple of working examples here for this element. Uh, one comes from the euphemism for orgasm in French, uh, le petit mort, the small death. This euphemism really highlights kind of two elements of this aspect simultaneously. The first that the um, there is a kind of death of the self um, or an experience of a kind of falling away of one's uh, one's uh, individuality in the moment of orgasm uh, that you lose yourself in that moment. Um, but the other is that this desire has kind of come to a culmination um, and that therefore it will die shortly thereafter. Uh, another example is uh, the romanticization of dying together in a song like Blue Oyster Cults, Don't Fear the Reaper. Um, and uh, psychoanalytic analyses of desire have uh, long kind of grappled with this aspect of, um, of romantic love and desire, Freud's death drive being uh, the most maybe infamous of them. The tension here, of course, is that a lover cannot elect or choose to die. They cannot have this kind of attitude towards any particular beloved because they have attachments, commitments, obligations to others. So now I want to transition to this kind of where do we go from here? Um, we've seen that even if we remove the uh, explicit kind of oaths of exclusivity from this model that uh, the other elements still push towards acting as though uh, one were exclusive with a particular beloved. 
So we've come up with three more or less uh, elements uh, or possibilities of where to go. The first is to potentially just embrace that there are going to be these sort of psychic tensions internal to romantic uh, love for uh, the uh, polyamorist um, and that we can just throw up our hands and say, well, uh, let chaos reign, <laughs> that uh, it'll be a hell of a ride. Um, the second element or the second option that uh, we've we've thought as a possibility is to further revise this model of romantic love in order to try to alleviate these tensions and then navigate them. Um, we're a bit skeptical, just to put our cards on the table, uh, that doing so will uh, provide a model of romantic love that is sufficiently different or distinct from non-romantic friendship. Uh, but uh, this is another way one could go. Um, and uh, we'll be kind of exploring that more in future work and thinking through that possibility. The third option, and this is for now our favorite solution, is that we reject the, um, the title or appeal of romance uh, to characterize specific kinds of loving relationships, uh, because after all, that does sort of implicitly create a certain kind of hierarchy, and we might favor instead a more expansive view or spectrum of friendship and loving relationships. Um, though uh, there is a possibility maybe that one could uh, continue to play with romance um, by treating it as a fantasy, as a fiction, which in some sense it really is. Um, and with that, uh, thank you so much. Okay, thanks so much, Lauren. So obviously after the end of the actual talk, we had an opportunity for a Q&A. We don't have the opportunity here, but we did want to take a moment for people who may be interested and flag a couple key points. Obviously, we won't be able to talk about everything uh, that someone uh, issues that people might raise or questions that they might have, but we just wanted to flag a couple points that were of interest. One of them is to highlight something that Lauren mentioned toward the end of her talk, an idea that we had been playing around with before the presentation, but that also came up in the Q&A, and that's this idea that perhaps romantic love can be preserved as a sort of fantasy. And so in some sense, romantic love began as a story, began as a narrative, and then we try to make it real. We try to bring it into the real world. And perhaps that's the problem, but perhaps as a narrative, as a fantasy, it is something that we can preserve. We just sort of have to recognize it for what it is and that's an idea that we're playing around with how to how to develop okay another issue that one might be interested in is the possibility of calmer romantic love so or romantic moments so you might have a romantic dinner say or you might have an old couple who's kind of really cute and you think like oh they're still romantically in love and so isn't there something like that that's not the intense ups and downs and, uh, and, and passionate kind of uh, obstacles everywhere kind of romantic love that we were talking about during our presentation? And while we feel a temptation to go in this direction and develop something there, we're not quite sure how that would end up being functionally different from friendship. And this was something that we emphasized in the presentation, that as soon as you try to make sense of the more peaceful kind of romantic love, it becomes difficult to see how that is actually going to be different from friendship. But we're interested in the possibility of making sense of something along those lines. But we did want to maybe say a little bit more about that issue. So I'll just let you chime in on that, Lauren, because I know you have some thoughts about it. Yeah, so I suppose there are a couple of things to say. The first is that this kind of um, calling the uh, the cute old couple romantic uh, tends to mirror a kind of historical transformation of uh, how we are our cultural conception of romantic love that 
um, is sometimes might be called like a happily ever after model or, or a fairy tale love that we've been sold. Um, and that change in, in what we've sort of deemed romance is actually historically the function of taking the model that we are outlining uh, here um, and kind of domesticating it, if you will, um, uh, trying to temper certain things in order to make it harmonize with socially sanctioned marriage and secure long-term relationships that are necessary for the perpetuation of society. But what that does, that kind of like happily ever after or romantic comedy as this kind of oxymoronic genre, what that's occluding is the fact that the romance, that intense feeling of passion is in fact over, but the myth is that it would somehow kind of continue into perpetuity. And that's just doesn't seem to, to us really to align with most people's everyday experience um, uh, of, of, of their loving, their long-term loving relationships. And in that way, um, these uh, relationships no longer uh, look like romance per se, but more so like friendship. Um, the other thing then would be to say, well, okay, so then what's happening? Well, either uh, the, you know, the kind of romantic moment, well, you might just be tapping in to your kind of shared history um, about, uh, of, of these romantic feelings, uh, or you might just simply be projecting this model onto um, one's friendship and, and how we conceive of it in part because of this, uh, this kind of, fairy tale happily ever after model that, that we've been sold by every rom-com out there. Um, so that's kind of, and we're still really sort of struggling and thinking through this, can, but. Can I ask uh, a question um, real quick? Yeah. Um, so see if I, if I have this, this right. So the idea is that you may have something that's, that's functionally kind of like a friendship. And in some cases, people will just code that conceptually as, as a friendship or a partnership or a companionship, but that, sometimes there's this tendency to take the same underlying phenomena and code it as romance, to sort of conceptualize it as romance. But then this raises the question of, well, what are you conceptualizing it as when you conceptualize it as romance? And that's where you kind of get this question of like, well, maybe what's happening is someone is bringing to bear the very story that we're talking about and as it were, trying to put that uh, square peg into a round hole where it's not really what's happening here because the romance is already passed, but there's this, you know, and Darujman is a psychoanalyst, like, you know, there's this, we're kind of bringing this desire that we have for romance to bear on something that isn't quite that. And yeah. that's, that's sort of a, you know, maybe like a little pessimistic or, or kind of sad point to, to end on, but I don't. I don't know. Did we don't know where else to end. Yeah. So, okay. So my thought here is then maybe to, to not emphasize so much what we might be giving up or losing um, by kind of demoting romance, if you will, to the realm of fiction or fantasy. Um, and instead, maybe embrace what we have to gain by doing that. So Romance is a particularly loaded term. It kind of functions to elevate this brand of relationship um, over and above all other kinds of loving relationships that we might have in our life and kind of our full emotional lives. And so I think our, our ultimate hope or our sort of idealized vision would be that, well, you know, why not just kind of democratize the playing field and leave room for individuals to take agency and really construct uh, their full emotional lives among all kinds of loving relationships that they might have um, and not overly emphasize or, or cast this 
one specific type of loving relationship as the end all be all, which this uh, model of romantic love that we've been sketching has a tendency to do. Right. That, and that's helpful because that kind of brings us back to some of the themes that we were talking about from polyamory, that that kind of democratization approach synergizes well with that, taking agency over your relationships and designing them perhaps in the ways that are best for you rather than sort of being given the script by society that's like oh this is the best way for a relationship to be like the romantic kind okay so that's that's kind of all we have to say maybe at some point we you know we're curious about the prospect of writing a book on some of this stuff I mean we can't stop talking about it so (laughs) um you know it's really exciting to us and thank you if you've listened this far into the video yes thank you so much bye everyone bye